Um, so my background is in history and I study the history of 17th century alchemical textual culture. And that is really rife with all kinds of anomalies in the name of secrecy and knowledge circulation. And so that's, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about where I'm coming from. And um, please feel free to raise your hand and ask any questions during this. Um, I would like this to be interactive and an opportunity for us to get to know each other a little bit um, within the topic of bibliography and make some definitions for ourselves that we can carry on to the rest of the workshop. So um, how I conceptualize and define materiality of the book is with its production, use, and reuse. So those three elements, I think, um, cover how knowledge is physically manipulated and conveyed through the vessel of a book. And I am gonna concentrate more on hand-pressed texts um, during my sessions. Okay, so first I thought we would talk about what a text is. And I really would invite um, you all to contribute to creating these definitions. Um, and you might be like, we all know what a text is, but some of these are words that we use so frequently that they sort of lose meaning sometimes. So I would like to make some structure around what we mean by a text. So um, thank you so much, Professor Renhart, for your wonderful um, introduction and showing us some a great history of textual communication already in physical objects. So um, what is a text, if you think really broadly, what could we consider a text like throughout time, the ways that people have communicated visually? And so then maybe I'll start with the question, is, is art a text or is an image a text? Um, and I don't, I don't have, these aren't easy yes or no answers, obviously, right? But um, I would like to sort of expand the category beyond a book. And then I might ask, what is a book, right? And so um, if we go back to the ancient world, we have papyri, we have um, tablets, we have glyphs that were etched onto things or um, create big structures and then carve the glyphs into those. So is that a text, do we think? Is it an, like, I think, I. I, I think what I'm trying to get at here is that these are textual objects, right? So many objects that communicate information, I think personally should be considered a text. Um, and then we have scrolls, right? And I wanna come back to the concept of scrolling. We had a great example of um, how the scroll was produced with the object that Professor Renhart showed us. Um, and then, as he said, um, historically, we move on to codices, and uh, that is probably the closest to the first definition of a book that would come to mind when you say, what is a book, right, or what is a text? Um, and then you have the machine press, the hand, the hand press, and then the machine press, um, and then you have engravings, right? So are engravings um, a text? Can they be a text? If you're printing them, you're sort of stamping them, um, creating something in, through which knowledge can just circulate. And today we ha we're talking about digitizing the materiality of text. So is this a text? And if you think about it, is a website a text? And how, what, and so maybe this is a little tricky because we have, we're a very multilingual group here, but the word in, English that you use to describe how you navigate a website is scroll. So that's why I want to come back to the word scroll because you might not, you might be like a website is not a text. You're scrolling it and it functions much like a scroll does. Um, and then you will also probably notice when you print uh, on, onto a sheet of paper from a website or something that's online, the formatting frequently is, is not the same experience as scrolling. Right? It cuts off at random parts and then you have to turn the page and maybe you get interrupted in your thought or concentration on what you were reading. So um, based off that very brief history of textual communication, um, anybody want to add anything that we maybe should consider a text 
that we wouldn't immediately consider to be a text. All right. <laughs> I'm going to do some, some um, interactive stuff where we get to know each other a little bit, and then maybe we can have um, some more back and forth. So um, I guess the question I'm trying to get at is, can something digital have materiality? And how do we communicate materiality digitally? Um, so we're in a digital age now, but theoretically, scholars that study um, digitization are arguing that we're also turning back to the material. So we've sort of gone from material objects to digital and back again to material, a focus on the materiality, because I think people are starting to realize that there's some drawbacks of digitization and having things digital. Um, take photographs, for instance. Uh, we used to print all of our photographs. You have to take it somewhere, print it yourself, and now they're immediately uploaded online. And so how often do you look back at a photograph that you uploaded online, you feel safe, like it's, it's in my drive, it's online, you know, do you, and then you forget, right? And if you had printed it, if you have a physical object that has um, materiality in which you have to move it physically, right? You're gonna interact with it more often and it is going to last. Um, and we have this notion that if something's digitized, then it lasts longer, it will last forever. Like we gotta put it into the digital repository so we don't lose it or back it up in the cloud. And technology changes so fast, like you, we all know that. And it, a lot of times can't keep up with the digital repositories that we have created. And so um, I would argue that a physical material object has the potential for longevity more than the risk of digitizing everything and then you know, the internet breaks down during the apocalypse or whatever, we lose everything. <laughs> um, so now I wanna turn to a different question, sort of flip the question. Um, so I brought up a few different examples of objects and artifacts that we might consider textual media. Um, is textual media an artifact? Is this slide an artifact. Um, once we digitize it, do we take away the humanity of it in a way where are we producing it, using it, and reusing it as we do with physical objects? Um, I thought this was funny. The British Library's prediction in the Vision magazine for 2010 was that by 2020, 75% of all titles worldwide will be published only electronically or in both digital and print versions. It's 2022. <laughs> Do we think this statistic holds up? And okay, so what is a possible reason why we didn't turn to digitizing everything or even born digital texts? Has anyone interacted with a born digital text and noticed some drawbacks about it? Yeah. Well, accessing it from different devices, from different places will change and will make referencing it or using it very different, a very different experience depending on who does it in a way. Yes. Yeah. Um, I also know that this is something that I've had colleagues that um, publishers are now selling electronic copies of academic texts higher than physical ones because of the uh, e-first e access in libraries policy, um, which makes them harder to access in research institutions and then harder to read in general for students or researchers. Yeah, there's issues of gatekeeping. That's a great point, right? So you have to belong to an institution that pays for this resource. Same issue happens with databases, which maybe we're more familiar with because a, there has been a bigger initiative to digitize um, archival material than texts. And I don't know if anyone remembers when the ebook came out, like um, the Kindle, like physical tablet, and it's, that's called a tablet, right? I, I'm very interested in the reuse of these words and um, what that means for materiality and texts. So it sort of functions like a tablet, right? But the, what's on it changes. Um, and everyone thought those were gonna take off and no one was gonna print physical books or no one was going to like it. And I never owned a tablet. I can't read like that. Like it's, it's, it takes away the experience for me personally of um, interacting with a material object. Yes. Um, 
aside from the experience of reading a digital object versus a physical object, it's an enormous amount of infrastructure to create a digital object, whether you're digitizing something or you're creating something born digital. So that's a lot of money. Yeah. Right? It's a lot of people, it's a lot of equipment, and it's a lot of data storage, and I think it's the data storage piece that's often forgotten, and that's why a lot of things even have been digitized we can't access anymore. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so that if if an object is born digital, you you need to access it and you also need to work with an entirely other group of people that have the skills to create these repos digital repositories and keep up with the um, you know changing technology where like think about a, a website from early internet days like 2003 um, could you find that website today on the internet where did it go like and so this sort of false notion that digitizing is the, equals longevity is something that I would like to explore. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit. Um, now I'd like to create a definition for bibliography. So what's bibliography? Um, and so here's some sort of like uh, just normal, typical definitions of what bibliography is just so that we are all sort of caught up onto the same page. Um, the study of books as material objects, and this can be expanded to include any media where reproduction is involved that could result in variants. And so that sort of helps address the question about media, like is a photograph a text or is, an, is a visual depiction of something a text? Um, so this definition argues that it has to be reproducible to result in variants. Uh, I'm not sure that I completely agree with the, those parameters, but I do think that re reproducibility is a really interesting um, question or way to define bibliography. Um, and in what way? Like, so you could reproduce a sound recording. Is that a text? And how would you, would you sing it yourself? Would you um, record a recording? And so the, that would create variant, right? Um, so you can, if you can organize something bibliographically, then is it a text, right? Because it has the word biblio in it. And, and then so we're expanding the definition of what a text is, I think. Um, the transmission of documents as printed books. So this is even sort of narrower. <laughs> um, and so part of the purpose of bibliography is to identify and describe printed books, right? So we can keep a record for ourselves of what is available and compare variants and um, yeah, judging the relationship between these variant texts to assess their authority. And again, this is another sort of old school definition of what bibliography is. Um, and then I wanted to, this is where we will all get to know each other a little bit better, I hope. Um, I wanted to ask who uses bibliography? Just librarians or do you think other people engage in bibliographical scholarship? Um, so then I went to ask, what professions are represented here today and how do you use bibliography? So I'll go first. Um, I am the Distinctive Collections Librarian at Villanova and I use bibliography to create metadata to make um, the objects in our collections available for researchers. And I also, previously when I was um, a grad student and a postdoc at the Science History Institute, I used bibliography to investigate the long life of a textual object. So, um, and oftentimes I would find anomalies that weren't recorded in the metadata of these objects. And al almost always, if you're comparing two copies of the same text, they're not going to be exactly the same. Um, some, some anomalies are more exciting than others, like, oh, this chapter is from a different edition and stuck in here or something like that. So that's something we're gonna talk about later too, is ways to find these textual anomalies and identify them and then describe them. Okay, do you wanna go, Sarah? Yeah, um, I'm a digital humanities professional and um, I'd say I work with geography to describe uh, books as well, but also to teach digital edition. This is my main use, I think. 
And other than that, when I use it, I use it to collaborate with you. We're <laughs> doing the bibliography, but I um, profit from it a lot. Great, thanks. I mean, I'm a codicologist. Bibliography is a thing that icky early modernists. <laughs> it's like codicology, but boring. Okay, so if you're working with manuscripts, like how are you um, organizing the information or communicating or comparing different versions? I mean, our, our, our versions are more different as a rule. So the, the early modern concept of the book as a consistent object across editions doesn't really apply in the medieval codicological context. Yeah, well, we're going to turn that notion on its head throughout the course of this um, week into the weekend. Uh, do you want to go around the room? We could start with you. <laughs> How do I use uh, bibliography? Well, I work uh, with the manuscripts uh, and I use, uh, use them to study language. So I use bibliographical data to, uh, to enable my uh, language study and language analysis. <laughs> So on. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, some philologists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also a linguist, <laughs> name is uh, Martina and Sandra. Yeah. So I think that we use, in our field, especially Sandra and me, we're working with, uh, we're trying to analyze and describe uh, Croatian Church Slavonic, uh, the language of the medieval uh, Croatian books. So I think that in our field, the history of a certain uh, book is often reflected in the um, variants of the text seen there. And that often it reflects on the fact that the I don't know certain um, language variant was used, and so uh, for us, in order to explain some language uh, data, uh, it's important to include also this kind of information. Yeah, mm. great. Thanks so much. <laughs> But not only, excuse me, not only language, but also the letters that are written, uh, the yeah. script, the script. Great, of the, yeah, that's really important. So that's, uh, you know, sometimes we study paleography and the shape of the uh, script. And <laughs> like uh, Christian as well. That's good, yeah, we'll More, do have some but, overlapping uh, uses, I'm sure. Uh, we... We, we are at least describing them. Someone is more detailed than that, <laughs> like Christian. Yeah, I mean, regarding paleography, uh, you have to use the, the, the bibliography in uh, everyday research. Yeah. Due to the letter comparison, uh, edition comparison, and so on. And uh, obviously, most of the times, when you ex uh, examine some new object, you also always make a short bibliographical mm -hmm. description, codicological description. Why do you make that, can I ask? <laughs> For further, uh, to uh, make further um, researches, uh, researches or investigations easier, or if you find some similar object for uh, easier comparison. So maybe you feel like it's your, like, duty or responsibility working with yeah. these texts to communicate more broadly that they're here and here's what is inside of them or what they're composed of. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, say that sometimes we are working with the manuscripts that uh, no one have uh, seen or are not uh, fam uh, familiar with the uh, wider pu to the wider public so we want to describe them uh, like uh, we, we are the first uh, researchers who yeah so you you want to stake your claim right like you want to say i found this i described it here's why it's important no but because we rediscovered are linguists like mm -hmm. we are working with manuscripts until 15th 16th century so they are not so like well known to everyone yeah um, do you want to go? Did we skip you? Um, yes, sure. Um, I'm a classical philologist and Byzantinist. And um, of course, I, I've been working with manuscripts also mainly from a philological point of view, just to recover texts and edit them. And I'm also more familiar with the concept of codicology than with that of bibliography in this sense of uh, describing the materiality of, of a medieval book, let's say. And uh, yes, but um, I think it's uh, very important uh, not to not to treat the manuscripts only as containers of the text, but also in this uh, more complex uh, 
um, approach of all the aspect, material aspects that have a lot to say about the use of the book, uh, about its users across time. And, yeah, great. Thank you. And so now I see how many philologists we have and I understand the blank stares when I was like, is art text? Everyone's like, I don't know. <laughs> Do you want to elaborate on your project? And... Okay. Should we go on here? Yeah, I'm also a philologist. Okay. So um, I think I can add on to that because when you ask what is text, is art the text? Um, in my work, I deal with illuminations and illustrations and also text, and I compare them. So I'm very ma materiality is essential to me, not only as an art historian, but also in comparing two things that are written, written and drawn on the same page. But, uh, yeah. Great, yeah, illumination, like illuminating um, letters, as we can see in these manuscripts, is a great point as to like the question of, is art a text? In this case, text is sort of art, right? <laughs> Great, thanks. So uh, I am too a philologist, <laughs> um, but okay. I work as a historian. Mm -hmm. I convert it, and, and I, I study the circulation <laughs> of a text through its um, embodiment and instances, which are manuscripts. It was never printed, but it circulated from it's from the late, uh, the early sixteenth century. So it's one of these cases of you do codicology, but you coexist with. Uh, the print, the act of reading printed materials. Yeah. So one of the things that you, we have been talking about, um, identifying text, it's one of the things you do through bibliography and working with catalogs and so. I'm making my own catalog of copies of this text. Oh, great. And you look at the actual objects, um, how they're made, how they're produced, used and reused. But I was going to say that one of the things that could be mentioned among okay. these are the acts of reading, right? We're talking about the the book as a material object, but that includes obviously how we use it. Yeah, the, you, the use, active, yeah. Uh, the active reading. The of physical, reading yeah. And the, the symbolic meaning, yeah, all of that. Yeah, and reading used to be so much more material oriented before the digital age, right? So I think people need that and miss that still, right? When you take notes, when you're reading something digitally, like, are you gonna open another browser window and take your notes there? Or are you going to have a notepad and take some notes? Because I find having the two things on the screen is difficult, right? Because there's readability, right? Issues with readability. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, do you want to? I am not a philologist. Okay. <laughs> I am a curator. And um, I also, in my own, separate research. Um, I'm interested in the history of the book, so I use bibliography in that research. I also use it in my job as a curator. I think generally I use it to make objects discoverable yes. and understandable in different ways. I also oversee the Middle English text series, which is a physical um, and digital edition of medieval texts and we use bibliography both in the creation of the textual edition so our volume editors use bibliography in that way but then we also use bibliography when we're thinking about our own editions especially right now because we're doing a big redesign of our digital editions so we're grappling with a lot of bibliographical questions with that great i would love to hear more about what questions you're grappling with all of the questions okay yes <laughs> maybe all the ones we're going to talk a little bit about so I'm thinking about uh, how you identify the bibliography. As you said that, can we think of uh, a audio type as a bibliographical object or a new tab? A new tab. In a, when we open, you know, as a research scholar, we are opening hundreds and hundreds of tabs at the same time. Mm -hmm. and we are thinking that we will read the, this one. Yes. So at a moment, we are going to somewhere else. And from that moment, uh, from that object to another object. So, so how we think about uh, the bibliography? So can, in a detail from my DHH, can we think about a new version of bibliography? And another thing is that, um, so how a culturally a bibliography is documented? Yeah. So, another, so in a Persian text, or in a 16th century Persian text or Arabic text, uh, is there there was a that kind of bibliography that was in uh, Western Europe that was not much available in Persian text. So 
there was a culturality of the bibliographical idea so in a urdu text uh, so medieval urdu or dakkani uh, urdu that's a proto urdu so the in that text we couldn't find out the the kind of bibliography <laughs> so so the bibliography has a connection with the culture also thank so, you so much for bringing up that very important so, point yes Uh, when we think about um, uh, um if you are thinking about a circulation of a text so there are, in 16th century there was a, a text arabic text that's fathul muin that's uh, written from my geographical area in india that has been circulated to uh, in the, through the indian ocean to the uh, west asia uh, that in uh so the, the is a juridical text islam judi, uh, juridical text that has been circulated from through the indian ocean to the west asia from west asia that has been circulated to the southeast asia that means uh that all the geographical idea that i am saying is from my bio, uh, my geographical identity so not not to be confused so in the norsha the text circulated to in the norsha so all this text doesn't have that kind of bibliographical idea mm-hmm. so in a cultural way i don't know how we can uh, place the idea of bibliography that is such a great question and thank you for bringing up that point um bibliography is definitely coming out of a western tradition of knowledge organization and what yeah what how do we deal now like do we just adopt this way of organizing knowledge and map it on to other cultures that haven't previously used it like no i don't think that is the best way to do it so how do we organize all of this knowledge in a cohesive way without mapping western ideas of how to curate and organize knowledge onto cultures that have been doing it other ways or d- haven't placed importance on that and i yeah maybe that's something we can explore i think that's a really great question so i have one adding also so earlier uh, the professor was saying about uh, there is a text that within text there is a uh, the specific text and there is a explanation of text so within tech in in the kind of tradition is also there were in uh, west asia and um, global south also so there is, there will be a small text so in the uh, side of that text there will be explanation so that 16th century syriac text as like syriac text there was uh, the kind of tradition is also in global south Yeah, that's a great yeah. Um so creating a bibliography within the object or a history of the text within the object itself is m- across cultures really, right? Like you see that in manuscripts frequently or I've found notes a lot of times that like this um text is part of, you know, this author's like series that they have of all these texts and so people are doing bibliography themselves right you don't have to be a professional to do bibliography in the margins and people have always been doing it um and cataloging their own personal libraries as well so that's a really great point thank you so much yeah um i'm also not a philologist <laughs> <laughs> i'm i consider myself to be for the most part a cultural and uh, intellectual historian Um so for me bibliography is um it's useful because through because uh, it allows us to get through the history of reading as you're saying. Um so things like the the affordability, the quality, um uh, the mise en page, uh, the you know the types of any and uh um our marginalia of a text uh, tell us a lot about not just the content of what was read but how it was actually read. And uh, quite often, you know, you, you find one text that you assume a reader would want to read for this but they're actually reading for something completely different. Um so yeah, bibliography uh, figures a lot into my research and also I have a side gig sort of uh, as a cataloger. Okay, so uh, great. and and for that I'm I'm working in between two different bibliographical traditions, right? The western tradition, the traditional Chinese tradition that are custom made for 
with block printed books. Yeah. Um, so it's also part of what I do is try to navigate a, a, a method to um, create uh, bibliographical information that address uh, both sets of concerns. Great. Okay. I'm definitely going to include something about this in tomorrow's um, hands-on portion. Uh, thank you so much. And I also um, wanted to say, oh, for um, reading practices and use and reuse of text, we need to make sure, like to your point, that we are divorcing ourselves from our current reading practices or taking like an objective look as much as we can and understanding that reading isn't innate. It's something that you learn and people learn to read differently across cultures and over time, um, the way people read changed, right? So when we're looking at a text, we should be keeping that in mind. People weren't you know, using their finger and reading like you brought up um, necessarily, right? They employed other ways and typically more interactive ways um, with textual objects. All right, would you like to? Uh, yes, um, I'm a rare books librarian, um, so I use bibliography quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I work mostly, almost exclusively, with um, uh, early printed materials, um, and as well as sort of relying on the work of previous bibliographers to sort of inform my work, particularly with cataloging books, identifying books, and um, identifying gatherings and things, um, but also uh, contributing to um, union catalogues like the ESTC or ISTC, um, and then sort of being very aware of recording the materiality of the book. Um, obviously, not just the text block, but the bindings, the book plates, uh, inscriptions, drawings, uh, whatever else might be in there or on there or around it, um, as well as uh, the abstract things that surround it, like former ownership that isn't. Uh, evidenced inside, but is otherwise known from other other um, surrounding materials. Um, so, all those sorts of conventions feed into my my day to day work. And I also thought it was interesting what professionals are, are represented here today. Because there's one uh, profession that isn't represented here today who I know use bibliography extensively after that, booksellers as well. Yes, but yeah, but <laughs> they're yeah, I, antiquarians definitely. Um, so. Something that you said um, brought up to me uh, the concept of reparative bibliography and reparative librarianship. And so you said that you frequently use other catalog records and bibliographical records to build yours. And um, do you ever have to go back and fix them? Yes, I've sent yeah, many emails right? saying yeah. this cannot be correct. Right. <laughs> this is not the edition. But so, it's, it's useful, of course. Um, if, if, someone's got, if someone has made an error, mm -hmm. um, I, I lit, something literally happened on Monday um, that, that like this, where someone mistook a, there's a problem with um, uh, the date, was the year was an error, mm -hmm. a printing error, and it created a huge amount of confusion about there being a ghost facsimile edition of this work, which never existed. And, uh, and it was only in two uh, libraries, uh, and that, um, the third one, the only one in Europe now, is in our library. And so I had to email back and forth with the, uh, the South African and the Australian libraries who hold it, and asked them to look at their copies, take pictures of their copies, send them over, we compared by email, and eventually we established there is no facsimile copy. This is the same copy. But it happens all the time. It happens so often, yes. And so that is a big part of bibliography is reparative bibliography, right? Going back and not just assuming that the catalog record that you're looking at is correct, um, because that assumption will lead you astray almost every single time. Um, let me just, okay, I think this will be my last slide for today. Yeah, um, so a final definition that I would like to flesh out, an important one before we um, move on this week, is what is materiality? Um, and this, I think, is a little trickier than the other two um, definitions that we did because I often find that I use this word constantly and I've been approached by people being like, what do you mean materiality? And really just not understanding and then having a really difficult time articulating what I mean. Like the, you know, the, and I have a colleague that describes it as the thinginess, like the something, right? And then um, when Professor Reinhardt was talking about other sensory experiences like smell and, um, and how big Th this text is, right? You need to communicate like visually what it looks like, um, maybe without a picture, right? Because the picture wouldn't necessarily do justice how giant this text is. So is materiality just tactile or should we think about it as a sensory experience or singing? We were talking about texts that you read and sing, right? Yes. Sorry, but just on that point about sort of the sensory aspect of books, 
Um, there's an exhibition on at the moment at Bodleian in Oxford about called Sensational Books. And cool. when you said smelling books, I just remember they have um, these little perfume vials of the di distillation of the smell of certain books or collections of books. So they have Ethiopian manuscripts and they have the whole the Duke Humphreys <laughs> library in them. And you tip it, it sprays you in book smell. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, so, I mean, look it up online because that's just one aspect of what one of the best exhibitions I've actually ever been to. Um, but uh, look it up online if you're in Oxford in the next uh, month. Um, do look, it's free. But um, yeah, it, it, it doesn't ans answer all the questions, but it brings all these questions in a very sort of immediate way in this exhibition. This exhibition. Thank you so much for bringing that up. That's, that sounds really fascinating. Yeah, I hope everyone can get over to Oxford and check that out. Um, so, yeah, like, and I, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily looking for an answer, right? When we're making these definitions, I'm, I'm posing questions and we should grapple with this and not decide something and move forward. I think we should be constantly, you know, wondering in our different cultural climates and as, you know, digitization changes and book production changes, what is bibliography? What is materiality? What is a text? Um, so... Here's some questions that I put that I thought of to help think about what materiality of a textual object could be. Um, so, like, what materials do books require for their production um, is sort of an obvious one, right? Like, what material is it made out of? And when I encounter people that don't really understand the concept of materiality of a text, that's usually where they stop, right? They're like, okay, you're looking at the material. And it's more than that, right? Because we said it was production, use, and reuse, and reading, and things that are beyond. The physical, even though we want to include the physical description, but maybe we want to include these other sensory experiences as well. Um, I already asked that question. Uh, so, and then here's some like sort of um, cookie cutter answer of uh, what it is. So, the material form in which a text is transmitted influences its meaning, and books are essential mediators of the knowledge they contain. So, could we expand that to be any? object or type of media that changes, affects the information contained within. Um, and obviously, I think we can all agree at this point, they matter as objects beyond the text contained within them. <laughs> um, and then I just wanted to bring this um, quote from the Pearson reading that I had assigned for this session um, on considering books as artifacts. Uh, in which he says they have so much more to offer us as cultural and historical artifacts, and if their rationale is solely textual, then their obsolescence seems guaranteed. So as we think about digitizing the materiality of text, um, we need to keep this in mind, right? And we have already sort of talked about and showed that books are not going to become obsolete. So on that note, digitization is not a threat. I'm not anti-digitization. I think it's very important in a different way to communicate information about an object. Um, and both matter, the object and the efforts at digitization. Okay, so I think we can break for today. Thank you. <laughs>